What's up, guys? This is Xander Monj. This is the Xander Monj Podcast. And today we have Thomas Ponsu Vandara. It, it's Ponsu Vandara. Ponsu Vandara. <laughs> <clears throat> Thomas is 20 years old. He goes to Rhode Island College. He majors in computer science, and he wants to grow up to be... When I grow up, I just want to be able to work from home. Okay, cool. Um, today's topic is uh, sneakers, shoes, flipping... And kind of like other stuff based on that topic and wherever the conversation takes us. I'm going to be dropping a lot of gems. So uh, for all you like people looking to, you know, venture off into a new side hustle, you better listen closely because this is this is gold. So I guess to start off, when somebody asks you um, like what you do, like what's your typical response to that answer? Like when, if someone just came up to you and said, like, what do you do? in your free time or like what do you do to like make money what would you describe your this as in the past you know because you know <laughs> you're my boy but uh i haven't been working for about a full year now since i've done uh reselling full time so when people ask me like oh like i haven't seen you in so long and you know we're catching up and they ask me like what i do i pretty much tell them uh i'm a reseller like i it's not just limited to shoes. Um, about 75% of it is shoes, but, you know, the other 25%, I don't discriminate against. How did you... The the shoe, I feel like, for someone who doesn't know, like, a lot about, like, shoes and, like, um, I guess, like, it used to be kind of, or it still is kind of, like, fashion, too, for you, or um, clothes. For someone who doesn't know about it, it seems like... It seems almost like you're like born into it, same as if, like if you if you were to see like videography, there's almost like a, a template on how to get in mm. that industry. You you get get a camera or your phone, you start making content, you build a portfolio, and you show people. For you, like, how did you get into sneakers, clothes, like, and all this stuff like that? Like, how do you like? I know you're on like discord chats i know you're like you know people that like do certain things that can help you and and you basically have like this you're like uh you're like the, those characters in those movies that like that just kind of like know what to do but you don't know how how do you get into it yeah or how did you get into it's it it's a very good question um <laughs> you know i actually like thinking about it now that we're talking in a podcast I actually genuinely, I I will say this, that sneakers and fashion, <coughs> high fashion, low fashion, all of that is actually tied into Hollywood and entertainment. It's a lot of, especially nowadays, um, to sidetrack really quick, back in the day, um, shoes, uh, the market value of a shoe was very um, passion, not passion based, but like popular interest base right so if you like a shoe that's black and white and a million other people like a shoe that's that the same shoe as you and then you know they have the exact same shoe that's red and white because you guys like the black shoe a lot your the demand is going to be higher therefore the price is higher now a lot of like original silhouettes that come out don't really have resale value unless it's a collaborative effort with like travis scott Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Beyonce, shout out Ivy Smith, and you know all these other big name influ like influencers basically. Yeah. So yeah, to answer that question, I would say <coughs> it's ho it's pretty much listening to hip hop music constantly, uh, following these celebrities on Instagram, and you know whoever their stylist is is pretty much hand selecting, hand curating what we see as a re the resale market. Do you think that it's almost the type of industry where you won't get anywhere if you don't act, if you don't like the shoes yourself? Like, do you think that someone could could hop into it without like respecting the shoe industry or like knowing about it? And why would they want to do that? It would be for like money. Because um, someone could do that with with video. Like, someone could hop into video for the money because they could just figure out how to like make a simple video that someone likes. You can, can you do that about shoes without having like a passion for it. You can definitely get into the <laughs> shoe market and learn 
just bare bones logistics and numbers and like, you know, I'm buying this for this reason and I'm going to make X amount of money, 100%. But I don't think you'll get far and I don't think you'll last long. Uh, to add on to that question too, it's like the barrier of entry for sneakers is actually relatively very low, but like it's pretty easy to get into a shoe. Like, come on, you just buy a shoe and you sell it, flip yeah. it for more. But it's a little bit more complex than that when it comes to like when you want to talk about the art of reselling, which I'll get into later. What age did you get into it? I and first. How did you like learn? Like, what was your process of like, like what was like the one day you weren't doing this? Was it like a sudden change or was it like a slow build up? Did you go from like wearing the shoes to like selling them, or did you just like how did it how did the breakdown happen? It's actually like kind of weird. I first got into it. Um, when I was 14 during high school, just like, because growing up as a kid, I never, like, I didn't even buy my clothes, like, all the way up until high school. Like, my, my mom and my dad, like, would just go to Marshalls, go to Burlington Co. Factory, and, you know, go to the Nike section, just buy a bunch of, like, very generic brand stuff, which I'm grateful for, because, you know, as long as I'm warm, and, like, I have clothes on my back, like, I'm not ashamed to say, like, it's not about what you wear. It's about how you wear it. True. So what sparked this interest into sneakers was like entering or persistence, basically. I was, it's a, <coughs> I don't remember what item in particular it was because I've gone through like so many shoes now and I've gotten kind of numb now. But I was trying, I remember like I just wanted something so, so bad. And like when you man when you really want something and you actually get it, True. Like, if you have, like, one goal, yeah, if you you have, it'll happen. If you have one That's goal, why goals are so important. Yeah, if you have one goal <laughs> and your goal is to get this sneaker, you're going to get it. So I got this sneaker in, uh, I think, 2017 or 2018. I think it's actually these that I'm wearing right now. Uh, I'm not going to – I'll kick my feet up, but, like – We'll put a picture up. Yeah, we'll put a picture up. Just say the name of it. The Comme des Garçons Supreme collab from 2018. All right, I don't know how to spell that, but sure. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <coughs> in 2014 i think my first uh pair of shoes was the uh, some foams why did you why did you foams. want those um i saw lebron james wearing them oh okay lebron james lebron james got the shoe early and oh, okay. i was just like wow is stuff like that like why people usually want it like they see like drake wearing like these new shoes or like is that why i think there's a uh, um why it affects the resale value and like why it be or why it affects like what demand. made you want that shoe and not like something else basically what made me want that shoe was like someone you look up to wearing it i definitely <coughs> do see lebron james as a role model but like i don't know it was something there was something compelling about it like the, the swag that lebron dressed it in maybe do you think that it actually has to do with this is like a, yeah. Th do you think that it has to do with actually how it looks or more of like the story behind it? Like, do you think how it looks matters like at all these days? Um, when it comes to like this stuff, obviously when it comes to like fashion and I stuff. I think looks are definitely like um, a part of the formula for why a shoe can be successful. And the story is just as important <coughs> as well. Like, just look at this. Look at this concept box right here why right yeah but it tells a story the shoe inside of it is called uh tur duncan so the 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 shoe the silhouette of the shoe is called the uh nike dunk sb so you, they made it a turkey th thanksgiving themed shoe but they called it the tur duncan get it yeah what are like the top reasons someone wants a shoe just to clarify like what's like the top three reasons a consumer would want the shoe one is like someone wears it like someone famous wears it is there anything other than that or is that or is there also like company history like adidas dropped something in like a series that everyone like if sony drops a camera everyone's like oh shit is there stuff like that in the shoe industry too yeah there are <coughs> the three main things that uh what makes a shoe popular and popping is uh one the look the colorway has to be nice you can't 
the silhouette, the chosen silhouette of the shoe, the shape of it, how it's curated, matters a lot. This is an Air Jordan 1, and it's one of the most popular silhouettes like that you see. If you were to make your own custom shoe with this silhouette, you know, you, I'm sure you could add some like dope swagger to it. Yeah. So the, number one is the silhouette and the shape. The shape has to be nice and the colors have to be nice. It sounds like a dumb question, but like you see people getting shoes like because this person had it or like or this company dropped it or something like that. Company loyalty. Yeah. But you're saying that people, some people genuinely just get it because they like look nice. It's yeah. People truly there are people out there who truly have a passion. The same people that uh, that I constantly sell sneakers to, you know, they're they're passion buyers. They're not they're not buying the shoes to make money off of me. They're buying shoes to put them on their feet and they're willing to pay that resale value. If no one was willing to pay the resale value of the shoe, why would I even sell it? True. Uh, so number two is collaborative effort. Nowadays, it's all about influencers and oh, like which <coughs> br- which brands are collaborating with a. Uh, with certain companies, right? So this year we saw Nike and Ben and Jerry's do a collaboration together. True. Insane. Like wow, right? Just wow. Like a cow, like it's definitely not a shoe that you could wear yeah. every day, but you see the story behind that shoe. It's an ice cream shoe. How do you feel about with stuff like that? Like when when you see like these well-known shoe companies partnering with with organizations that have nothing to do with like fashion. I love it. I think I think it's like essential because that's just (coughs) such a dope shoe. Like, yeah, like when they do that too. Look at, look at this, like just look at a shoe and when they take a a completely different approach to it, like that's, it's just dope man. it's just dope stuff. I love, I love unique approaches to shoes and like spicing it up. Even if it's not for like normal everyday wear, like it's not like a, you know, it's not everyone's taste. Yeah. The fact that it exists is what I like about it. So that's like the collaborate. So there's like people who like how it looks. There's like the collaboration. People yeah, who brands, like like the brands, like what brands mix like together. Travis Scott shoes. Is there like a third reason, or is that like the two main reasons? Um, a third reason is the quantity. Actually, not oh, like how many there are in yep, the world. How many? Ex- how many currently exist in the world? Um, supply and demand. Sh- yeah, supply and demand. Certain shoes are m- widely available. Like, you know, the shoes True. that sit at Foot Locker, the shoes that you see at the mall, those yeah. aren't those aren't limited edition collaborative <coughs> shoes or high demand <coughs> shoes. You won't see these you won't see um you won't see like high demand shoes in store because they're sold out. Breaking it down again, it's uh the look. The shoe has to be pleasant to the eye and like wearable. Number two is the collaboration with a shoe. Who's the name behind it? What's the story behind it? What's the meaning? Yeah. Is it is it a Valentine's Day theme shoe? Is it a Halloween theme shoe? It, or it, does it represent peace? Does it represent Black Lives Matter? Does it represent freedom? And then the third is just how available it is. Supply and demand. There's not enough supply for the demand. So there's like the consumer who gets it for like those three reasons. What's your job in this? I'm a merchant. That is my role in this. So how do you know what shoes people are going to want? Like you also have that same passion for it. Like you would wear them if yeah. you weren't selling them. There are, I wouldn't say that. I would be a liar if I said every shoe that I buy, I would wear. However, I, <coughs> I have to do market analysis on these shoes and see which demographic, like I have to see the demographic for the shoe and see which, which people are going for it. Right. So if it's like a skate shoe, I'm going to look at skateboarders. How do skateboarders feel about this shoe? And if how do you do that? Like, how do you analyze that? A marketplace app such as StockX, Go, eBay, to evaluate the market, um, the market value of a shoe. And how do they know? Like, do they like, like, how do they know if people will like it or not? Like, because Ben and Jerry's could have dropped this shoe and everyone could have been like, "That's stupid." Yeah. Because that happens with some stuff. Like two companies collab and someone's like, "Why?" Um, and not ev- not every collab. <laughs> Is successful, um, which I'm glad you mentioned that. Ben and so Jerry's how do is people, one of the Yeah, ones. so how do people know, or how do people know if people will respect a collaboration or not? Social media feedback, pretty much. Yeah. You know, when <clears throat> when you see like a lot of Instagram influencers like posting these shoes, such as a, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the Dior collab. The fact that you even saw it and you're not even in the sneaker world, like 
that go I'm pretty sure that says enough but there's a lot of other <coughs> shoes that have released that you haven't that haven't caught your eye so you can you can really hear the noise like a lot of people in the sneaker culture in the sneaker world make noise when something's popping and you just have to open your ears open your eyes to it using just like my world I guess if like if the FX6 came out, right? This new camera, you didn't know it existed, but everyone I know did. And that's because I sp- like I've been in this world for like 10 plus years. I've like known people who do like videos. I know people who like research cameras. So like I would know like that's how I know. Like I grew up making videos. I've met people along the way, like from like school, like the internet and all that stuff. How did you meet the people who care about shoes? Like, did you meet them through school too? Or like on the internet? Or like, how'd you meet all these people? It's uh, it's pretty much basic networking, you know? You always, you always have to be the one to ask questions. And if you're not asking questions, you're doing something wrong. If you're not curious about anything and you're not asking questions about it, you're doing it wrong. Stop thinking about it. It's not worth your time. How I first got into it, uh, I basically hopped on Twitter. I hopped on Twitter. I started following a lot of, a lot of you know, sneaker sneaker pages. Basically, you know, people who post sneaker news, blog blogs, right? Yeah, sneaker yep. blogs, sneaker blogs. That's what it is. <clears throat> I pay. I started paying attention to a lot of sneaker blogs, and then I started incorporating into my Instagram. And now, my Instagram and my socials are all filled with sneakers. True. And so you made it like you made it your world. I cur- Yeah, I curated the world myself. By seeking by, information. By following, asking people on like subreddits, articles, yep. like Googling the questions. DMing people uh, about their input. Like, what do you think about this? Why do you think this about that? <clears throat> so, so we, so yeah. So we know why people like them. Um, we know how you like get your world to kind of, your at least your online world or a, a side of your online world to revolve around that. How say a shoe does drop that everyone cares about, you know that it's gonna sell. What's the how do you approach this situation? So now you know there's like a shoe, there's only like three thousand, and like you know like it's gonna it's gonna resell for a lot. No one's gonna actually get it from like Adidas. No one's actually gonna get it from like Nike. What's how do you approach the situation when you know everyone wants that shoe? When it comes to limited edition shoes like that and like shoes that are sought after in high demand, that's when the networking r- really plays an important role. You know, not not everyone has the time of day to, you know, sit on a computer and try to buy a shoe via the website. And not everybody has the time of day to physically go into a store and attempt to buy a shoe in person. So with networking comes relationships with stores. I'm not just building friendships. I'm building business relationships with boutique stores all across the world. I have friends in New York. I have friends in North Carolina. I have friends in Florida, friends in Chicago, and friends in L.A. that can hold me down, that I talk to. I might not talk to them on a daily basis, but when we do talk, it's strictly business. And, you know, their stores can hold down a pair for me for a premium price. And that's pretty much how you obtain the release. And another side of uh, obtaining a high demand release is botting. Sneaker botting is at an all time high and it's growing every single day. What's the most challenging thing about getting the shoe then? Is it, is it kind of just super easy after that? Like you can just get any shoe you want or is there, is it, is there always like a challenge? The challenge um, comes in uh, various forms. When it comes to, uh, networking and you know connections with with uh, with your plug basically there's there's social and like political issues that come into play such as what if what if nike catches them you know backdooring it, which is the term that i'm going to use a lot in yeah. this podcast you know they're essentially not sell they're not selling their pair of shoes to a normal like random customer they're holding it down on purpose for me which is backdooring a shoe yeah. What if Nike catches them backdooring and then, you know, there's going to be consequences and repercussions. So that's like a dang, as like that's a, a risk. That's the risk. Of as a side topic, 
what benefit do they get from side dooring it or back dooring it to you? Instead of selling it for like, why don't they just sell it to the consumer? Instead of selling it to the instead of selling it for retail for one hundred seventy dollars, they sell it to me for more than that. So they're getting more money. They're getting more than the retail price. So if if um for example for a shoe like this, which is an Air Jordan One, is one hundred seventy dollars now. Yeah. Back in the day, it used to be one sixty. But I would, I'm not paying 170 for them to hold it down and like risk their job. Yeah, I'm gonna be paying um, the market, pretty much the market value so of the shoe. How does it get to them? Like, do they just uh, it's automatic? Like, uh, they get it straight from the supplier. Since yeah, <coughs> since they're since they are they are re- retailers, like official Nike retailers. Yeah. So they you know their store their brand has a contract with Nike to that like allow, get the yeah, shoe that allows them to get the shoe. So they get their stuff directly from Nike. It's not like fakes or anything like that. And and then you'll. And then I just ask them someone, to, someone pops in, and then they like they offer them like, what like uh, more than the price is supposed to be for retail, and what do you only get like one or you buy them all? Oh, uh, it's per. So, you're gonna. That's something that you're gonna have to negotiate with them. I can tell you this though, you're never going to build a relationship with a store buying one pair of sneakers. It's always in bulk. Proper planning <laughs> prevents poor performance. So, yeah. When I go for a sneaker release. I know it's going to sell out. I know that there's going to be people out there left without a pair of shoes in their hand. Cool. And, and because of that fact, I know that, you know, they are my, they are essentially my buyers. If they really want the shoe, they're going to, they're going to have to pay a premium price to get it from me. Okay. So is the challenge there like offering them a price that, that makes sense? Or is it like, what's the, what's the challenge when it comes to that, like the backdoor side of it? Um, like what's the hardest part about that? Is it not even hard after you have a relationship going? After you have a relationship going, it's it's really easy. It's super so, easy. But the hardest part is getting that relationship because true. You there are like you know there are different methods that you can approach a store. I'm spitting gold right now, by the way. To to all you guys out there listening who are trying to get a backdoor plug, don't be a weirdo. <coughs> Please just don't be a, don't be yeah, a, don't you, be a, don't be a fucking weirdo and like go into the store and be like. Yeah, I'm assuming it would be like, like you knew that you grew into it too. Like you exactly. bought from them, you knew them for like a long time, it's and a, then you decided. Exactly, it's a work. It's a constant working relationship. If you're going to approach, uh, you know, an employee at a store or a friend, you're 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 gonna you're gonna become their friend because you guys have to be boys. You guys are gonna have to establish a, a relationship, and you know, and be cool with each other, because back the backdoor culture and like you know. Getting all these sneaker plugs is a very like a very hush hush like conversation. You don't just you don't just go out about your day and tell people, Oh, I get my shoes from this store because what if a Nike representative is on the street like watching you? Right? Yeah. And and once <clears throat> Nike finds out that, oh, they're not they're not these aren't fair releases, right? They're not they're not doing fair releases for customers. Yeah. And why would I want them to represent our brand as Nike or as Adidas. Why would we want someone doing shady business representing our brand? And it's not fair for uh, the people who genuinely love the shoe. Yeah. So you can't, you can't just, so that's also like like just very much grown into. Yeah. Just like anything else. You have to work, you have to work for it. It's not just, I mean, there are rare cases, New York, there are rare cases where you can just walk into a store with $75,000 cash and you know, yeah, but, I know all of you watching this are broke. Probably. So then there's like the botting side of it. What's like the hardest part about the botting side of it? And I'm assuming that's the more popular one. Um, Botting is definitely more popular because the barrier of entry is lower than, uh, you know, physically going. Sometimes you don't even like I don't live near a store in Florida. You know what I mean? We don't live in Florida. I don't live in L.A. Yeah. So building that that um, relationship pretty much only um matters locally right you want to build relationships with your local sneaker shops that's yeah. what you want to do when it comes to botting now you have worldwide access we have people from europe people from asia uh you know botting united states websites and shipping it back home overseas to europe overseas to asia now it's an now it's a whole different uh whole different beast a whole different market so at that point isn't it just as hard to get it it is there are it's there like, are hardships in both. I wouldn't say one's harder than the other, or one's easier than the other. The hardest thing, <coughs> the hardest thing to understand about botting is, 
on paper it's i click a button i buy a shoe i make money right yeah but a lot of people don't see the the expenses there there are a lot of overhead expenses that like like i'm sure with film right it's like oh why don't you just grab a camera and press record yeah but what about your sd card what about your attachments right you're gonna have to buy uh, attachments for your cameras what yeah. about if you want to add lighting now? Right now, you have to buy lights to set up the lights. Yeah, it's oh, the same thing, probably. Yeah. Like you're there's buy, o- there's you're a lot of shit. there's a lot of overhead expenses <clears throat> that go into it. So like, is that? And is it it's, w- sometimes it's luck. Like sometimes the online stock of a shoe. So there's different stock levels or like the quantity of shoes available. Sometimes a, a shoe is has like a thousand pairs in store, or I mean, a few hundred pairs per store, like around the United States. Yeah like locally around you and then online it, it'll probably be about like ten thousand, right Ten thousand pairs sounds like a lot right yeah but like i said it's but a whole yeah. different beast right you have people like all you need is internet basically to access this uh you know this uh this pool what happens after that is everything clean after that like is it is it like after you press order if that shit's confirmed is it like you're in or is it there's still like other things you have to get through yeah can it get like canceled you you can get canceled can it get like you can get canceled really (laughs) really 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 like instantly right like you will buy a shoe and then you'll get an email saying order confirmed right nice you got it and then literally 30 seconds later your order has been canceled yeah like those are i I deal with a lot of cancels is there anything you can do to get not to still win but to like lose less like can you hit the company up and be like yo do i get like a gift card because like you (laughs) fucked me over or like some shit like that, or do they just cancel you? I bought shit naturally before that's been like canceled after I ordered it, and they gave me like fucking Amazon money. Do you get to do like a last kind of leap for like to lose less in the shoe world, or after they cancel your order, is it just like I buy you lost like? Um, that very like how a company responds <coughs> to to like you know it like your, your situation it just depends on the company and i can tell you off the bat that these sneaker companies foot locker champs all you guys finish line jd sports champs you guys are all assholes i hope if one of you guys are watching this you guys definitely need to you know reevaluate your values just as a company you. yeah th- uh no remorse at all like bye oh that's too bad so it, you know they definitely add salt to the wound but one thing that you can do to prevent cancellations is to perfect your setup. The overhead expenses that I was talking about earlier goes into uh, proxies, which is you know masking your, masking your bot, basically masking your bot, because yeah. you know if you, you can use your home IP in your bot, but you're limited. You know you can only make you can only probably cop like one to three pairs max. Yeah. But you need you need more proxies to give you more chances to get like ten clips, hundred clips, thousand. Is clips. there is there a difference in, or is so when you when the shoe comes out is it is there always a rule like you can only buy one? Yeah, that's the oh, okay. it's a one limit per customer rule. But <laughs> so so say that you did get it, you got this far, you found out why people like it, you found out that it's gonna sell out, and then a side note after you get it from like a a store back door. Is there any challenges after that that you might face where they need it back, or is that just is that one kind of just like done? Uh, done deal. All right, and so, cash only. Back doors are done. Cool. With Benjamin Franklin's <coughs> only. So say no wire. Like sometimes you can do a wire. So say them. you got this far, like you got it through either a back door and it's like done. That that one's done, or you got it through, through online and that one's done too. Like it's it's like confirmed and it it didn't get canceled. What happens after that? First, we're going to the back door play. When you do a back door. It's a like meetup. Like I'm meeting you pretty much in a dark, not a dark alley, but like you get Basically, the gist. I'm like not, me- I'm not, I'm not, me- I'm not meeting you in front of the store. Like, yeah, I have to meet you somewhere else at a at agreed location. All right. And you know, you pop the trunk, and we move the shoes. I give you the cash. That's it. Done deal. Now we have the physical pairs in hand. So that's easy. When it comes to botting and online ordering, post COVID, uh, shoes would ship relatively fast. You know, within three to five business days. Cool. But because of COVID, shipments have been delayed like seven days plus. So, you know, stuff has been slowing down. And does that affect anything? Like the shoe's value goes down because it takes longer? Um, Or like what happens? How has the shipment affected you? That's a good question. Shipment delays market crash. So you can tell when the price of a shoe is going to dip because when 
when buyers start to get their pairs in online or in hand, you know, if you're a buyer and, you know, obviously you have to sell to someone, you're a lot of a lot of people at the same time are going to dump, right? Dump the shoe, right? Yeah. Sell base essentially sell fast. Yeah. They're not going to hold on to the shoe for a year to wait for it to go up. They're just going to sell and make their, you know, make the quick flip. Yeah. So when it comes to the quick flip, you know, like because you bought the shoe too, you know, oh, in seven days when it comes in, there's going to be a lot of people dumping pairs online, dumping pairs around, like in basically dumping, uh, letting out the pairs to a, uh, to yeah. the buyers, to the people who want to pay. So resale. less people want them, or like value goes down. Um, value only goes down, not necessarily because demand goes away. Value goes down because people want to get rid of the shoe that fast. If that makes sense, right? Okay. So like, yeah. Um, it's just human nature so in thirteen year olds, pretty much. Like a, a lot of people can. Uh, back in the day, everyone agreed. Like, oh, we're just gonna charge five hundred dollars all the way around, right? Yeah. And that's a that's a respect thing. Before all of these apps, before eBay shoe selling, before StockX, before Go, it was an agreed like street. I would pretty much call it the street market value because back in the day there wasn't any third party you know shoe apps. You yeah. can't buy hype shoes on a lo- online. You would only have to you would have to know a sneaker plug. So has the shipment affected it or is it like whatever? It's like is it is like the extra it's three a, days like it's nothing? Just a, it's just a timing thing. All right. There's also different methods <coughs> to sell too. Like a lot of, like I uh, mentioned briefly before, there are people who fast sell, right? And make the quick cash right then and there. Yeah. And then there are the people who hold the shoe because then it's like a physical stock. A sneaker, argue with me and your mom. I don't care who, you can't argue with this. A sneaker is a physical stock. Yeah. Like this is like a share in Apple, except with sneakers, it only goes up. Yeah. Because um, they never, they won't, they will never release the same shoe twice. And if they do, they call it retroing. When you retro a shoe, you drop the same silhouette, but you know you add a little different. You know what I mean? Maybe you swap the color blocking, but but never the original same shoe. Yeah. Which is why shoes up like hold their value really, really, really well and stand the test of time. So. So say, so yeah, say you got it. It's it's shipped. The seven days doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter if it comes in three days. Doesn't matter if it comes in seven days, really. But like, would you recommend shipping it like to like? some fucking P.O. box or like would it get shipped to like the person's house or like does it not really matter because it's just come does it just come in like a box like a normal um, box yeah it just comes in a <coughs> we have a sneaker box right here this is what it all comes in just a normal box a normal cardboard box there are um to answer that question it it varies in how like what type what kind of seller are you right are you a seller who's going to be fulfilling pre-orders, right? Are people ordering before the shoe is in your hand and praying that you can fulfill their pre-order, which is why it's called a pre-order? Yeah. Or are you the kind of seller who's like a... And that's based uh, on like reputation, I'm yes, assuming. Yes, that's based on reputation and, you know, if you're the... Your brand, what, whatever you want to do to sell the shoe, basically. Yeah. Like, however you want to market yourself. And then there's the people <coughs> who do it freestyle, you know, I'm going to buy the shoe and I'm going to do whatever I want. If I want to f- leave it in the closet and let it raise its let 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 it make money for me over time, that's what I'm gonna do. If I'm if I'm an active seller, I'm gonna quick flip it, you know, right then and there as soon as I get my hands on it. I'm looking to I'm, I'm looking for a seller ASAP. So, all right. So say it comes, you unbox it. What's the process like? Do you what do you do when you unbox it? You make sure it's like real. Like do yeah, you like always. check everything? Like what do you do? Always make sure your shoe is real. Always make sure your shoe is clean. Always make sure your shoe does not have any defects. And is it fine to like, does the box just come like a normal, like it's not taped shut or anything? Like, can you open the box and like take it out and like touch it with your hands and all that stuff? Yeah. Um, the term dead stock and brand new only applies to if you wore the shoe or not. But like right. we can, like you can touch the shoe and I could still sell it as brand new dead stock. Yeah. But so no foot has ever entered this shoe. Okay. And it still smells. First thing I do is smell the shoe because I just love this. There's something about the smell of fresh shoes. It's like a new car. Yeah, it's like so, a new car. So you like take it out and you like check the box. And does the box matter just as much as the uh, shoe? Yeah, condition of the box matters too. So, so but sometimes, you know, shipping gets rough and like some some of that stuff is out of your control, whether there's like a dent, a small crack. Yeah. yeah. Like say you got it from like Nike with a bot. What's the worst thing that could happen once you open the box? 
the worst thing that could happen is the box is completely obliterated. Like the US, <coughs> UPS, USPS guy straight up just like hum this, <laughs> like hum this to Mars and like an alien, like with a baseball bat, like smacked it back and the box is just but all messed up. But that's the worst basically. Is, is anything else other um, than that like the shoe, pretty impossible? The shoe could have a defect, like a factor, a manufacturer defect. Doesn't that, is that worth more? Because uh, it's a manufacturer error? It, like, because that happens some, sometimes. No, sometimes. Yeah, I yeah. know what you're talking about. It depends on uh, it really just depends, because manufacturer defects come in uh, various forms, right? There, you could get a manufacturer defect that just makes the the shoe look entirely different, but it's real, right? Yeah. Obviously, because it came from Nike. Like, what if this was like, what if this was like, I don't know, spotted leather? Like, this is insane. Like, you've never seen this before for yeah. this for this shoe. But then there are other manufacturer defects, such as you get two left shoes. You get two right no. shoes or your Nike swoosh is not stitched properly. It looks squiggly, right? It, it could look kind of corny, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe the folds, maybe the ankling is like done poorly and like it's, it almost looks like it's tearing off. There's different levels to, to defects. Have, have your experiences on boxing usually just been clean or has there been a situation where you opened it and like something was like not how it was supposed to be? Um, the worst that's happened to me is damaged boxes, but luckily, luckily I haven't gotten any like two left, I haven't gotten two left shoes or two right shoes, but I see the horror stories like all the time. Yeah. You unbox it and it's real. Like then what, like, where do you sell it? You have a lot of <coughs> options nowadays. You know, you have a lot of third, third party apps and marketplaces such as, like I said before, StockX, Goat, Flight Club, uh, eBay, like those are all like official, valid, like uh, marketplaces, you know, that people actively buy on. And like, how do you decide price just based on like everything else? Uh, yeah, you have to look at the people around you because, you know, you have to be realistic. If yeah. people, if, <clears throat> if a hundred people are selling it at 350, you're not going to sell it at 500. Yeah. What's the typical profit? Is it like 15% like um, increase? Like if you paid a hundred. Oh, margins and percentages? Yeah. Like sneakers. It can vary or like what? Yeah, it varies. It can go. Percentages are important when it comes to reselling. A, a lot of people can get distracted in the dollar value, but you have to realize it's small wins and it's small wins that like win the <coughs> war. It's right. Does yeah. that make sense? It's small wins that win the war. If you can keep your profit margins at pretty much 20%, 15 to 20, 25%, like er, consistently every single time, like, you have a growing portfolio. No matter where you start, your portfolio is exponentially growing. And and uh, I would say like my, the typical is probably between uh, fifteen to twenty five percent. Yeah. So, f physically and visually, how do you make a portfolio? Like, how do you let people in the world know that you're like you sell these shoes and that you know how to get these shoes and all that stuff? Is, is it like Instagram and like it's a flexing. website? Flexing. All right. It's a lot of flexing and saying like, you like hey, own the shoes. Yeah. And look, like take I got pictures and look, stuff. I got all these <coughs> pairs of shoes and you don't. It's all, it's basically yeah. flexing, which I'm not about. I'm a. But I'm you a, have to. Yeah. Exactly. You have to I, like put I pictures have to up. because I have to. I'm trying to. I have to as a buyer. Like I have to sell it. You know. Like. Yeah. I don't. I could just sell online, right? Like I could just ship the shoe to, you know, an anonymous buyer uh, via eBay or third party app. But yeah. uh, sometimes local buyers pay more, right? And sometimes local buyers are faster, right? It's a, hey, can you meet me here? Here's the cash. Bang, bang. You just made your money in, you know, less than an hour of work time. Yeah. So say, say that <clears throat> the shoe, and I'll just use like a hundred dollars, whatever. Say the shoe's worth a hundred. Say you got the shoe for a hundred, and let's say a hundred percent profit, whatever. Say you sold it for two hundred, so you made a hundred bucks. But like, do you think it's like shit because like all the time you put in, and like the bots and shit that you had to pay for is the actual profit only actually like even smaller than like the hundred? It probably oh, is. Oh, I like, know what you mean because is, is because there like, are overhead expenses that go into it. Yeah, is, is it like you made a hundred bucks and? To to anyone you show, they're like, holy shit! Thomas just sold sold those shoes for for a thousand dollars. You're like, well, he bought it for nine hundred. Yeah, a lot of people don't see that. <laughs> he side. made a hundred and he spent seventy on his bot. There are certain so like, how do you overcome that? Um, like, do you have to like just keep doing it more and more, or is it 
do you think it's destined to be a side thing unless you really have like a team do it every day uh, buy like in bulk all the time have like cash flow you can like, make serious <laughs> money if you have a lot of money to start out with because it's all about scaling right yeah if i if i make a th- if, I, if you can make a hundred dollars off of a single pair of shoes what if you had 25 of them right that's 20 that's 2500 yeah. so um and then to answer overcoming it other than being using your parents credit card and like stuff yeah. like that to like help you start <laughs> up when you're reselling you you have to really like look at your finances and your overhead expenses you have to break it down because it's very easy you can very easily you know go over your budget and overspend yeah. on uh, on overhead expenses because it, it almost it almost sounds like um certain bonds it, it cost sounds like certain. it sounds like a non-profit like like you you get the shoe you like do people get stuck in like a non-profit stage where like where they get the shoe they they make their seller happy they build their portfolio they pay themselves like they have their own salary but then like profit wise they're not left with any other money to like do anything um, like business profit wise it could slow down like the thing about sneakers is nothing is guaranteed right like there's so many like there's so many like things that can affect your your cash flow your flow of money right like i said like if you have a backdoor plug right and you're killing the game right you've been killing the game since for like two years now right yeah what if what like i said what if your plug gets caught by nike now what now now and now you see how your yeah. lifeline is cut so now it's pretty it's not over for you because you know you still have other relationships but like there are certain like there are lifelines in sneakers, which is why, which brings me to this point actually. No, there is no one you know that resells sneakers that like made it rich. Think yeah. about th- think about that for a second, right? There's so many people who flex pairs, flex all these you know lucrative, expensive, rare sneakers, but none of them are actually like rich. Yeah, it's just it's just like one source of income. So it's like one. It's like a, it's like it's truly it's truly a side hustle in my opinion. You can definitely make a living. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but, but you'd have but to go all in. Yes, you'd have to go all in. And like, for ninety nine percent of people, let's be honest, ninety nine percent of people don't even have one thousand dollars to start, five thousand dollars to start, ten thousand yeah. dollars to start. Would you say it's like gambling? Sneakers is not actually gambling <clears throat> because it's calculated risk. Like I said, it's True. proper market evaluation, right? And when you when you just like when you do anything for so long, you you develop the eye, right? The eye when you know something's just gold. You yeah. know something's you know something's worth it. Something's worth your time. Something's worth money, and something's <laughs> like it's pretty essentially good for you. So, and in sneakers, there's so much information on Twitter and social media, and like there's so many like resell cook groups, people selling information on like, oh, this is this shoe is a cook. This shoe is good. You know what I mean? This shoe's gonna profit. There's so many people who can tell you that to your ear just by following a page on Instagram and just like that, like just like that, like that's how you know, that's how you know hundred percent for sure that a shoe's not going to brick and like you lose money on buying a shoe. So, and at least with shoes, you can return it. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the, the no risk part of shoes. If you buy a shoe that you lose money on most of the time, you can just return it to the vendor. How does it feel when you get it to the buyer's hands? It was it was a journey for sure. Um, in the beginning, uh, you know, you were there. Like, I, I finally <coughs> I finally got my hands on a bot that I didn't have to pay thousands of dollars for. I got it for the retail price three hundred dollars. And then at the time, like, at the time, like, I just see all these people hitting with the same bot, the exact same software that I have. How are people hitting shoes that I'm not hitting, right? So through through trial and error, and like perfecting my setup, finding the right proxies, finding high quality proxies. Uh, you know, making virtual cards, uh, changing my address, right? Uh, adjusting, like jigging my address uh, in certain ways helped out. And yeah, basically like every day, every week, every drop that I, sp- that I took an L on, I spent like looking back and reflecting and like, oh, how am I going to make this work next time? And it feels, I, it felt good, not going to lie. When I first hit my, when I first hit my 50 clip, on Yeezys, like <clears throat> I was, I was like so happy, you know. Like I, I didn't even flex it. I was just like in my room, like I was like looking at myself in the mirror, and I was just like, "This is like what you wanted, right? Like, isn't this what you wanted? You know, you have a tower of shoes that you could, you know, you could stand in front of and flex. You know what I mean? Like, oh, hey, look, I have all these shoes. 
but uh looking back uh it was now nah, it was it was it's definitely fun and like you know you definitely get a, a rush a high and a dopamine boost from it but uh now that i've like done it for a little bit longer and like not that much longer to be honest like probably like a year uh it's pretty numbing but that's just i can speak for myself not speak for other sellers because i'm always moving on to the next thing i i never like i'm definitely gonna still do it like on the side right but like yeah like i don't it doesn't need my full attention anymore right i yeah. found i found my <coughs> secret i found my my formula i can formulate it over and over again i know it works um i my my mind doesn't have to pay attention to to the discord like to the servers to all this information constantly because i developed the eye right if i see something i know and uh now that it's automated like that's the goal actually with sneaker botting or sneakers in general that's how you're going to succeed you're going to you're not going to succeed by constantly like spending your physical time like a nine to five you can't treat this like a nine to five or like a 12 hour work day you have to find ways to automate it for so yourself streamlined. yeah exactly so it's streamlined it's you have a little bit less weight off your shoulders you know you you know the ins and outs of it so you can make it work for you in a way yeah um <clears throat> what's your advice to someone who's who's like interested in getting into it um one advice i would say is to you know you need you need capital but if you are truly, you know, if you started from like pretty much like nothing like me, okay, cap, I didn't start from nothing because I saved up money. But yeah, <laughs> um, if you if you're starting out, you should discipline yourself and reinvest that money back into sneakers. It's so easy to take your profits and go out to eat food, but just know that profit isn't like like you have to build your portfolio, and that's how you're gonna get rich. You can't just spend and like live outside your means. Like if I make forty dollars, I'm not gonna go buy a forty dollar meal. I used to. Yeah. I used to, but uh, you know, now that I'm a little older, a little bit more responsibilities, can't do that anymore. <laughs> this is the Xander Monge podcast. My name is Xander Monge. This is Thomas Ponsuandara. This is Thomas Ponsuandara. Thank you guys so and, much. Um, cool, cool, cool. I message this kid for uh for a PS5. <laughs> thank you thank you guys for tuning in though and thank you for having yeah, me yeah and then lastly i just want to add that um we used to use as an example but this applies to uh, like ps5 and clothes all that stuff there's so many different uh <coughs> same 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 any, thing anything but rare like, anything rare yeah. and anything rare that you can think of that sells out instantly like i got you hit my line <laughs> right here bing, yeah yeah tell bing, them where to find bing, you bing. Tell them where to find you if they're listening on Spotify. If you guys are listening on Spotify, uh, follow me on Instagram, Thomas, P-H-O-M, M as in Mary. And then, um, yeah, thanks for watching. Thank uh, you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys uh, learned something today. And then uh, tune in tune in for the next one. Peace. Oh. <laughs>